If we're writing 6502 machine code and we want to create a routine or program that can be placed in any location, then we have two choices. We can either create position independent code or make the code relocatable. Here I'm going to show how to make our code position independent and I'm going to use a few different examples and this uh, video accompanies a um, an article on the Tech Tinkering website which goes into a lot more depth, has lots of full examples and um, I will explain it properly. But uh, for this video I'm going to demonstrate using the Vicmon uh, machine language monitor. One of the easiest things we can do to make our code position independent is to replace jumps to absolute addresses with branch instructions because a branch moves to a relative address so minus 127 to plus 128 bytes from the current address. Uh, however, the, there is no branch always uh, to directly replace a jump with, and therefore we have to create a synthetic instruction. So we can do that quite e easily using the branch on overflow clear instruction. So I'll demonstrate that here. So we'll clear the overflow flag first of all and then branch if overflow clear so this will always jump because we've cleared the overflow flag and then we'll jump to a location I don't know where it'll be yet I'll say there and then just to prove that, uh, that this is working we'll do a jump to 0282 and therefore if it doesn't jump it'll end up in an infinite loop which we don't want to happen naturally and then here we'll do our break and then we'll go back to our location there and we'll jump to 02A7 which is our break command and if we come out of this we can now go to 02A1 and there we are we can see that the PC is set to 02A7, which is our break instruction. So we, uh, we created a synthetic uh, branch always instruction, which we can replace our jump absolutes with. Uh, this isn't entirely foolproof because uh, sometimes we will need to, uh, to jump to somewhere that's more than minus 127 plus 128 bytes away, in which case uh, one way we could do this is using an indirect jump. So we could store the location that we want to jump to in, say, a data table that we've already cal calculated the, uh, the absolute addresses for, and then jump via that. Whilst the jump absolute uh, instruction is relatively easy to replace with a branch instruction, it's a little bit more complicated for the jump to subroutine, JSR, instruction. So what I would do here is create a table of... Um, of uh, jumps to the actual location that we want to do. So I'll demonstrate this by creating a couple of subroutines uh, that we could uh, jump to. So what they're going to do, they're just going to set a value. So they'll set uh, a value and then they'll return. Another one. And then a third one. Okay, so that's our three uh, subroutines. And then we'll create a jump table. We'll create that at 02A1, uh, where we uh, ran this before. And all the routines do is just jump jump to the subroutine. And then the next one. And then if I wanted to demonstrate this, uh, we can 
Uh, put some code somewhere. I'll put it at uh, symbol to AF, ESR, and then we could use the force of the second. Right, there we are. So uh, the top bit of code from 0334 to 033C is three subroutines, uh, each one just loading uh, the least significant byte of the address on which it's located. And then at 02A1 to uh, 0A29, uh, we've got the uh, jump table. So what we would do in our code, we would calculate this jump table so we would find a location that we know in our code and then from there we would create absolute addresses from offsets that we know that the subroutines are offset from in another point in the code and we put the two together. If you look at the article on the Tech Tinkering website it shows how to make the calculations for the absolute addresses. It shows how to do this in code and, uh, and it's easier to look there than, than I could demonstrate in this video. But in any case, you can see that we've got a jump table of three uh, entries and three subroutines to which to jump to. And then on line uh, address 02AF, we've got our JSR statement to jump uh, to jump to subroutine at 02A4, which in turn jumps to uh, the code at 0337. When we JSR, it puts the return address on the stack and then the RTS in the subroutines will return then to the JSR, not to the jump. So if I go through to AF, and then we can see that AC is set to 37, which is correct for the second subroutine. I've mentioned about calculating the absolute address uh, from an offset. Uh, but to, know, to do that, though, we need to know an absolute address of one point in the code from which we can calculate the absolute address using the offset. So uh, I'm going to show how to do that. Uh, there shouldn't really be too many situations where this would ever occur, because if you were loading the code into memory, then surely you could just get the address from the loader. But in any case, it makes an interesting little uh, bit of code, so I'll show how to do it. Uh, so if I... Uh, well, create a bit of code at 02A1 and so this is a little get PC routine so it's going to return the program counter of the calling JSR and it does this by pulling the uh, the return address from the stack and well, actually before I do that yes I'll carry on so I'm going to store it in location 090A, as I 09, yes, 090A. So I'm pulling the locations off the stack and then so now at this point I've got the least significant and the most significant bytes of the return address. So I need to push them back onto the stack. And then I need to decrement them by two so that I can get the, the address of the calling instruction. So we'll do this. I don't know the address yet. This will be 1D, F, C, D, E, 1E, I imagine. Let's have a look. E and then deck. Oh, AF. Zero nine. Use that, and then the same again. Let's decrement it once. Right. Decrement. And go back up and change that again. And RTS. Okay, so that's our get uh, get PC function, which is going to store the calling 
GSR's program counter or address in um, 090A. And then if I create the actual core, so I'll call 02A1, and then I'll break. And if we go to 0334, so it's executed it, and now if we look at address 09, ah yes, we need to create a virtual zero page. So there's the location zero. So uh, if you look at the 3403, but it's um, the significant byte first and then most significant byte. So it's 0334, which if we look near the top of the page, we can see that's where our JSR instruction is. So there we are. So we've got a fixed, we can use that to get a fixed point in memory uh, in our code. It's quite cumbersome getting that into into memory, into wherever it is that you store. You need to store that into a store the get PC function uh, subroutine in a static location, and that can be a bit of a rigmarole uh, because you'll have to sort of load each byte, store, load, store, load, store, load, store for each byte of that get PC function. But uh, but in any case, it can be done, and then once once it's run, you've got the PC location, and you can also overwrite that get PC because you shouldn't need it again. To access data and run subroutines we need to calculate absolute addresses for them. This can be done by using offsets from a certain point in the code and adding them to that point once its absolute address has been determined. Uh, so we need to find an absolute address first as our reference point, and this could be supplied either by our machine code lo loader or sort using, uh, using something like the get PC routine just shown. So the code here shows how the absolute address could be used to create a data table and that's calculated to refer, so each entry in the data table refers to a point in memory that you would like to access. So, uh, so for example, uh, if we look here, we have a, a hello world message. Uh, but in our position independent code, we couldn't just point directly to that because we wouldn't know where it was in memory. So therefore we could create a data table which has an, has an index for each entry each address within it and then we just reference via that entry. So um, so to calculate the absolute address, if we look here, first of all we're getting our PC, getting our program counter for this line and this will give us the uh, address for start. And then if we go down here, we're going to add our offset uh, to PC. So PC contains the location of start, and then we're going to add to that hello message minus start. So there's start, and there's hello message. So this will give the offset from, uh, from start, the offset of hello message from start. So we're going to put the least significant bit and add that to PC, and then we're going to store that at an index within the data table. So the data table is located at 0334 hex and the index is 0. So for each new entry in the um, in the data table you would add 2 because uh, each address is a 16-bit address so 2 bytes. So back to here so we're storing it in the data table, we're storing the least significant bit and then we're adding the most significant bit of the offset and storing it in the uh, in the next address. Uh, so there we are. So that's how we would create a data table, and then we can just uh, access uh, reference each entry in that data table to uh, to get uh, the addresses that we're looking for for the static data in our code, which I'll demonstrate next. If we now look at how we would uh, access a value from the data table. Uh, we can see here in this bit of code, uh, which is a, just an extract, so it hasn't got all the get PC code and what have you, but uh, you can see hopefully what's going on. So here's the subroutine say hello, and then 
this is going to print our hello world message. So first of all, we need to find out the address of the hello message, of hello message. And, uh, and we'll do that by loading from the data table using index i hello message. So we'll load that into A, and then we'll store that at temp dptr. Uh, so this is where we're going to store our, um, uh, our temporary data pointer, so the, the address that we're pointing to. And then we're going to, so we're loading this uh, least significant and most significant bit, a uh, byte, sorry, into temp dptr, which is stored at location uh, fb in the zero page. And now to access that message, we just use indirect addressing. So we're loading temp underscore dptr. Uh, we're loading it indirectly uh, from the zero page. Uh, so that's going to point to wherever in memory uh, hello messages that we determined when we created our data table. And then we're just indexing it using y. And this is a normal way of outputting a message uh, using the, uh, the ch root uh, kernel um, uh, subroutine. So uh, yeah, nice and simple. And once you've done it, it's easy to do. The only problem is it does create quite a bit of overhead. So you can see that we've got uh, four extra instructions there, uh, plus um, uh, plus an indirect uh, indirect load there. So we've got extra cycles and extra bytes, which may not be an issue depending on the code that you're using, but it is something we need to be aware of. I've mentioned the overhead in terms of extra bytes and extra processing time, the extra cycles that it needs to process position-independent code. One way of avoiding much of this is by using self-modifying code. Uh, but um, the only problem with this, of course, is that we can't do it if the code's going to be located in ROM, because naturally we can't self-modify ROM. But if, that's not a, uh, but if it's not located in ROM, then self-modifying code can be a good way around this. Uh, so the way we do it, we have a table here that has addresses that we want to change. And then we have to change that by an offset that we calculate. So if we look at further up of the code, we know that there's a starting point here. We don't necessarily know what that starting point is but we can work it out. So in this example, I'm using a basic stub because it makes it easier to, uh, to load the program. So we can find the location of that basic stub and then we know the offsets will be from that point. Uh, so we know that basic is loaded into, into RAM and then the start of tokenized basic is stored at the location uh, 2B, uh, the txt tab here you can see. So all we need to do then is query txt tab, and then we'll have the address of the uh, start of the uh, tokenized basic, so this point here, and then we can do our calculations from there. The start of machine language, I've calcul calculated that using this label mlang here, and then subtract, uh, subtracting start from it, and there, therefore all the offsets, or the labels mentioned here, will be in relation to this label here, to this point here. So th those offsets will be, will be fixed, and then it's just a question of shifting them then uh, by the start of tokenized basic. If we weren't using a basic stub, we could query, the, uh, query where we are in memory using the, uh, the get PC subroutine that I've shown. Uh, but for here, we're using the basic stub. So we've got a table here with our offsets. So if we look at the first, uh, the first address that we want to change, it's main plus one. So if we go to the main function, uh, the main label, sorry, and there we are, we can see we've got two subroutines that we want to be called. Uh, so we're going to JSR to say hello and JSR to say goodbye. So if we go back to where we were, so we look, the first one is main plus one, and the second one we want to change is main plus four. So if we have a look at these, so main, that's the, uh, the JSR instruction, and then plus one is the, uh, the address for say hello, and then we have plus four, so we have naught, one, two, 
three, and then four. Say goodbye. So that will change addresses pointed to by those JSR instructions to point to the say hello and say goodbye. And then we have further ones here. Uh, so say hello plus three and say, uh, say goodbye plus three. So if we have a look at those. There we are. And we have subroutines there. Say hello. And if we count the instructions, so in naught, one, two, three. So hello message. And same with here. With say goodbye, not one, two, three, bye message. And then if we look at our bye message up here, you can see that we've got two strings, hello message and bye message. And then those functions, say hello and say goodbye, essentially just going to print those strings. So there we are, we've been able to, we've got a, a self modification table that's changing addresses of subroutines and addresses of strings and then we just need to self-modify the code. Once we've self-modified the code, there's very little overhead then, uh, and we could even write over or use the area that the self-modification routine was in as, as extra data storage, but in any case. So here we are, we have the setup SM. So we're setting up the self-modification. So first of all, we need to get the start of tokenized basic in this example, and we're going to add to that the uh, address for SM table which is our, uh, our addresses to change. So it's a 16-bit add. So we're going to do that there. And then we're going to store the address, a pointer, an absolute address to SM table in P SM table, which is located in the zero page at location FB. Right, so we've got the address for uh, the self-modification table now. And we, because this example is using a basic stub, uh, we also need to record the fact that we've uh, modified the code, because otherwise, if we ran the code a second time, it would offset it by a further amount, and everything would be wrong. So we record that we've, off that we've uh, so we've already self-modified the code. Right, okay. So we now want to calculate each address to change. So we add to our offset in the self-modification table, the first address, we want to add text tab, so the start of tokenized basic to to it. So we do that here. And now we have the address that we want to change. And then we have to work out how much we want to change it by. So we're going to add to the self-modification address. Uh, so we're storing, I should say, we're storing self-modification address here at location 09. Right. And uh, yes, so we've got self-modification address stored. And then we want to change the value that's at that address. So we're going to add again to the self to the value at self modification address SM address uh, the text tab the start of tokenized basic and then that'll just shift it by the amount that we need to move it to to have it in the correct location in memory and and then once it gets to the end of the uh, end of the table uh, we'll find it in the correct place and then. We, uh, we record here that the uh, self-modification has been done. Sorry, the code up above was to skip self-modification if it's already been run, and this one's to record it. And then the program just runs as normal. We call the uh, say hello, say goodbye subroutines, and return to the, uh, the calling code. So uh, all in all, uh, self-modification is pretty easy. Uh, what I want to do now is show it being run on a, uh, on a VIC-20. And if you want to look at the code in more depth, uh, you can have a look at it on the accompanying article on the Tech Tinkering website, and I'll also upload a repo containing it on GitHub. I have assembled the self-modifying position-independent code that has the basic stub in it uh, using the XA assembler. And if I load that now, so that'll load. And if I list, we can see the basic stub and uh, I can run it, and there we are, hello world, goodbye world. So it's loaded it there. Um, what I'm going to 
do, just to make this a bit clearer, is have a look at the address. So there we are. So the address is, six, um, is at uh, 4124. Right. If I now switch to a different system, say uh, an 8K system, where BASIC will be in a different location, we'll have a look and see where the sys location is there and see if it still remains uh, remains working, whether it's the position independence is still functional. Okay, so now we've got an 8K RAM expansion in. Load the program again. The list. We'll have a look at where. And there we have, we've got a different location now. So if we sys 4636, and it works without any problems. Quite a long video today. Uh, hopefully it made some sense. The article that accompanies it, the article on the Tech Tinker and website, have a look at the notes below. That will make a lot more sense. It'll explain it fuller. You'll be able to see uh, a few different code examples, uh, some full examples and some individual code examples explaining what's happening. Uh, and hopefully you'll find it useful and interesting. So. Uh, do, uh, do subscribe to the Tech Tinkering YouTube channel. Have a look at some of our other videos and some of the other articles on the Tech Tinkering website.